Good morning, welcome to WHUT Studios, Howard University Television, right here on the campus of Howard University. I want to thank you all uh, for joining us here in person, and those of you watching on YouTube, joining us virtually from around the country for this incredible uh, event today as we celebrate the screening and our work with ARC-12 and also a uh, question and answer period and a reception following as well. So again, want to thank you all for coming out and being a part of this important conversation around mental health. It's something that many of us personally deal with or also have a family member or someone that we know. And so the more information we have, uh, the better we can, can deal with it and learn from it and be, be better folks and live our lives better and better every day. So again, thank you for joining us here at WHUT. We're looking forward to an incredible conversation today. So stay tuned and uh, enjoy the conversation and get your questions ready because there'll be a lot of good conversation coming your way. Right now, I want to bring up Mark to hear, uh, Mark Theory to come up and give some remarks. Mark is the producer of the ARC-12 project, project and has a lot of great information to share in the mental health space. Mark. This is a culmination of a dream come true. My son, Noah, um, had this vision, and he shared it with me. And I said, man, let's do it. He always talks about, he always says, when I leave this earth, or before I leave this earth, that's his line, before I leave this earth, I want to do some amazing things and help a lot of people. So I'm going to use that line to say, but we're, while we're on this earth, we're going to do some amazing things to help people. The cast is amazing. Um, Austin Carmichael and Christian Capellan are two young men, I haven't met anybody like this who are willing to share their stories of personal um, ups and downs and, and um, victory. So I want to thank them for being here too. Um, talented, powerful, incredible young men. We all know that we do, we're one step away from somebody in mental health, whether it's us or one step removed. And what we're trying to do with the R12 Project is we're going to be an educational resource to tell people where to go to find the help that they need, peer to peer. That's what Noah needed. That's what Chris and Austin needed, peer to peer. And uh, and I love it. I'm just so happy to be here uh, on the HBCU of the HBCUs, Howard University. I've learned that, and I like saying it. Um, so sit back and enjoy. I'm going to introduce the film. Um, it's been edited to a short version. It's not the full film, but but enjoy. And uh, we'll get back after that. Thanks. Three amazing, amazing young men who are very courageously and generously going to share their, their very intimate and personal stories, especially as it relates to suicide. My intention to do today is to have a real honest conversation and kind of just glean some of the wisdom that you might have from your experiences. And if that's cool, I think I do want to start with Noah since this ARC-12 project is related to him. I made it one of my goals, like, you know, to help as many people as I can before I leave this earth. And I got together with my dad and I thought, hey, you know, if you helped me and we helped each other, we should be able to help other people. And my first college I went to, I went to Hampton University and they had a counselor on site. And I talked to them and I said, hey, I'm having like, you know, I'm not planning to do it, but I'm having suicidal thoughts. And that's like a no-no word, basically. So after that, they, you know, they sent me to, you know, they called the police, they sent me to like the hospital. And that was a very scary couple hours because I was like, I don't think I'm going to do it. I just wanted to ask for some help. And I don't think it's the best way to do it because, you know, now you have me back to the police car, you know, driving to a hospital and I'm scared for my life and all that. Because, you know, like, what, you know, I don't know what they're going to do to me. You know, the first time I'm in a situation. And because of that, I, you know, I kind of closed myself off a little more. But, you know, throughout, like, quarantine, like, everyone had, like, to talk to each other because kind of all you had to do. I just started, like, you know, just open up more about myself and just be like, you know, this is who I am and this is, you know, what I want to do with myself. And, you know, if I want to, you know, be a helpful person, then I got to, you know, 
got to help myself first. And once I get to that point, then I can help other people. Christian, you want to tell us a little bit about your story and what, what brings you here and the ARC-12 project and everything? I probably had like three more days of college before I submitted my final paper and I like applied for graduation and stuff. And that's when I got a call from my, from my family back home that my little brother committed suicide. Because I actually went on YouTube and I did a life update where I spoke about it. If you follow me on social media, you know that my little brother passed away um, on July 7th. And um, I lost my little brother to suicide. He took his own life. He was depressed. Um, he was going through things and he felt like he had nobody. I spoke to him that morning. I was on my way downtown. And I said, hey, bro, you sent, you sent me a message like about a week or two ago saying that when I asked you, how are you? He said, holding up. You know, I was like, oh, that's a bit, that sort of alarmed me. Um, and I was like, oh, shoot, like, you know, he's, he's going through something, you know, nothing crazy. I didn't think of it that too much. So then, um, in that same, that same morning, I said, yo, bro, what's going on? And he's like, nothing. I just feel like a fuck up. You know, I just feel like nothing's, you know, nothing's going my way or whatever. And I told him and I said, like, it's going to be okay. That was the last message I said to him. I said, it's going to be okay. Things are going to get better. That's what I said to him. Things are going to get better. I love you. Those are my last messages to him. I, a, part of me feels really, like, guilty for not opening up and telling him everything that I struggled with. Although we were so close, me and him was closest. But just like, yo, I've never lost nobody close to me. Um, God forbid I lose anybody close to me. And the last person I thought was my little brother, bro. Last person I thought would have lost was my little brother. I went into a spiral of going into drugs again. I even had my own for a um, month or two where I was feeling suicidal. Um, but because of the person that I have been and I've been very outspoken, I was able to uh, let it to, I didn't let it get to a place where I was in trouble. I feel like I'm doing better. I'm finding company. I am speaking out. I'm asking people how they're doing. And sometimes the best help is just helping other people. So I feel like I'm doing this right now. You are very fortunate to get on the other side. And the fact that you still struggle is what keeps it real. It's what makes you even more valuable because you're still finding your way and you've still been through so much. And keep it real. Don't put on a facade. Don't make it fake. Just like you're doing now. Just keep it real, yeah. you know, and find people where it's safe to be real. You know what I mean by safe? You know what I'm saying, right? Yeah. So, Austin, you've been listening to the conversations I've been having with Noah and Chris. And Tell us a little bit about your story in connection to ARC-12. One of the big things that I appreciate about ARC-12 is that I get to ex um, share my experience. Um, there was a point in time in my life where I felt as if I was worthless. I felt like I didn't deserve to be here. I felt as if everything I did was a, a big mistake in my life. So there was a point in time where I took 28 pills of Zoloft and... Uh, I tried to commit suicide. I actually, um, sorry, I actually uh, passed away for uh, 30 minutes and uh, had three seizures. And when that happened, I was in the hospital. I was in a coma for a week. So with the R12 project, I'm here to inspire others because when I awoken, I got to see who was all really there for me. The whole time I was never alone. And sometimes people think they're always alone, but there's never a time in your life where you're ever alone. There is always one step to take and that is pick up your phone and call a family member. And that's all I had to do. So R12, I feel as if this is like a big thing in the world that people need to hear because some people think that money is everything. Some people that think that they're there for each other, but it doesn't matter about any of that. It just matters that you're never alone. Are you one of these people that remembered that experience? Do you have um, any of recollection of that? It was peaceful. Most people don't want to hear that. Most people want you to say that they went to heaven, they went to hell. But the one thing I will say, it was peaceful. Well, like we can assume then it wasn't hell. I mean, so, you know, <laughs> you're doing something right, right? Yes, sir. So what's the rest of your experience been like since that, since that moment? Have you felt that that was like a major game changer and that you are going to make the most of the so-called second chance? Or is it one of those things where 
you know, the, the, the fear of spiraling is always there, that it messes with your frame of mind. Where are you in, in your process? Okay, so when I got a second chance at life, I took a blessing of it. Um, the doctors, when I woke up, they said, you better be grateful that you're here because there was a 90% chance that I should be dead right now because um, my heart rate was at a 217. My, um, my lungs were failing. I had to get Narcan two times. So when the doctors told me that, I took a huge blessing because of it. So I went to college. Um, I'm a junior now. Me and my family are way closer than we ever been. If I ever need something, I always make a phone call to one of my friends or my buddies. It's just more to look at, at life now from a spiritual mm -hmm. level because I have a second chance at life and most people don't get second chances. And one of the biggest takeaways from this was before I uh, tried to commit suicide was that I wanted to see who was all going to be there for me if I ever passed away. You know, like everybody always wonders who is going to be there for, there for me if I ever die. So when I passed away, I got to see all the people on my Facebook, Instagram, and uh, all these posts about me. And there was a lot of people there for me that I didn't even know that was there for me. So it was a big takeaway from that experience. I love you sharing that. And I think that really yeah. is the thing. We take each other for granted, right or wrong. It's just we get so busy and distracted with our life that it almost feels as if, A, we're alone, and B, nobody cares. And then because you got to live through that, you got to experience how much care there really is out there for you. And yep. yet everybody is so busy doing whatever it is that they're doing, you know? Self-love plays a big factor in somebody's life. Um, if you have no self-love towards yourself, it's, it's going to be a hard life. So basically what I did, I took time. I took time away from social media. I took time away from everybody um, except for my family. So I, I had to take time to learn how to love myself. And I feel like that's the biggest problem in life that is that people don't understand their true selves. Everybody's always there for somebody else, but nobody is there for themselves. So I took the time to understand what life is truly about. And life is just an experience. Life is not mm. about what can you do or what can you get done or how rich you can be one day. Life is just the beautiful part of it. And that's the thing people don't understand. So what I did, I understood. I, th I took time to, to love nature and, and to understand how beautiful life truly is. So after I did that, I took time to post on Instagram about my story. And it reached out to probably a, at least a thousand people who go into my DMs and tell me how thankful they are for my story and how I'm brave enough to share my story. So that's one thing I could take away from my suicide attempt. And uh, I, I truly hope I can inspire others because no, it wasn't worth it. And no, you cannot get, maybe possibly get a second chance like I did. Because like I said, I had, my lungs were supposed to collapse. I was supposed to have brain damage. I was supposed to have heart failure. I'm, I'm truly meant to be here, but I'm not supposed to be here. Do you have any advice on how someone can actually be there for somebody? What would you recommend? What would have worked for you? Let's just okay. go with that. Uh, that. That is a wonderful question, Dr. Michael. Tell them you love them. I mean, go out and hug them. Sometimes people just need a hug, man. I'm telling you. Um, my, I love my family to death. But one thing I can say, I'm not going to say any names, but one thing my family thought that was right for them and might have been right in their own head. But what they did, they gave me gifts, you know, mm -hmm. whenever I was down, whenever I was upset, I would try to talk to them. They would tell me I'm OK and then give me twenty dollars or fifty dollars or a pack of AirPods. And, you know, yeah, that's wonderful. Yeah, I should be grateful for that as a kid. But one thing I can say is money is not everything, man. Money is not everything. All I wanted from my parents or from a family member or a friend was a was a hug, dude. What are the things that you did to help yourself and how did that work out for you? Um, I would say that I tried to go to a therapist. Um, when I tried to schedule an appointment with the therapist, basically what they told me on over the phone is that I told them I needed help immediately. Um, I was crying over the phone uh, saying that I, I didn't want to be here. And basically what they told me is that I had to wait a couple months in order to get in with a therapist. 
I find that a big problem in the United States is that they find mental health as a joke. I was bawling my eyes out over the phone, pleading for help that I need to get in there ASAP. And basically what they told me is that it's going to take a month for me to go in there. And um, I feel like as if therapy can be a lot better by a long shot. Have you played around with the idea of putting together your success team, like having people that you can call? Do you have a good Rolodex now that if you were ever in the situation that you were in before, that you'd have good resources readily available? Yes. And uh, I would like to say that is anybody. You can go to anybody in the world and tell them how you're feeling. It doesn't matter if that's your buddy or a family member or a school buddy from the past. You can go to literally anybody and ask for help. So I would say that helps me by me asking simply, can someone talk to me right now? You know, mm-hmm. it's but to anybody. No, would you like to answer that question? I'm, I'm grateful for my friends. You know, they're, they're, they're really good people. Just like the best advice, just, just be a good person to your friend. Right. How, does he think it has helped you to be there for your friends as well now? I mean, like at that level that you're needing it, do you find yourself reaching out and really being like emotionally there for them as well as physically there, like ready and able to do anything? Mm-hmm. Or, oh, right? Yeah, like one of the first things I'll like always do, like I'll, I'll always ask like, are you okay? That's like That's like the first thing I'll do. And if they say, like, no, then, like, you know, I'll talk to them more. But if they say, yeah, I'm fine. I don't want to talk about them. Like, I'll be like, okay, I'm here when you need me. You know, just, just let me know. I'm here to listen. How about for you, Chris? What Noah said, just listen. Be there to listen. Because I feel like had I sat down there at that train station and just picked up my brother's phone call and heard him cry and spoke for 10, 15 minutes, I'm pretty sure he probably would have been here still. Listening goes a long way. You don't know what people are going through and you don't know how much a listening ear goes. You don't know how far that goes to some people. And actually the purpose of, of ARC 12 is to do this. Here are these amazing 20-something year olds that are sharing honestly of what's going on here in 2022 and what we're facing. And I think the heart to heart and the depth of which that you guys are willing to share is just the fuel for a better future. So I'm really excited for ARC-12, for, for the, and especially the three of you guys. I really, really appreciate deeply the vulnerability and the openness and the rawness and the fact that you're just dropping a bunch of truth bombs here. Hey, that's powerful, right? That was very powerful. Um, can we give these young men a round of applause for sharing the way they shared? I'm going to speak very briefly because it's, I watched this, um, and it's an hour-long program. And I watched it from beginning to end. The first thing I told the ARC-12 people, I said, look, if we're going to run this on WHUT, we got to cut this up into parts because it was just, it was a lot. Um, but it was so important. And I kept watching. I couldn't stop watching it. And I was so inspired by it. And uh, I said, we absolutely need to put this on WHUT and all of our channels. Um, To introduce myself, my name is Angie Ange. I'm our director of content here at WHUT. I'm also a very proud Howard University alum, uh, School of C, class of 2006. Whoop, whoop. Um, And I am a, a young radio vet who left radio to come back to Howard, um, to come back to WHUT, to push the next creatives, the next generation of creatives, to be that guide that I wanted when I was here at Howard. Um, And so to be in a position, we have a unique duty and we have a unique opportunity as WHUT where we can be in control of, of what we put on the television screens. And so being a director of content, you're thinking about what does our audience need to see? And our motto is your story, you know, your station, your story. That's what we're supposed to be. And so I always look at different programs and I think, is this a part of our story? And could someone else relate to this story? And I've never experienced what these young men experience, but 
the beauty of content is that you get to see through other people's lenses. And the more we see, right now these cameras are on us, you're watching us through our cameraman's lenses. So the way that they see us, that's the way someone on YouTube or wherever you're watching us, you're watching, you're seeing us. Um, and so what you see through your lens, what, what my man Torrance is seeing, you know, Tree might not see it. Friendness might be seeing something different. We all see a different because we're shooting, we're getting shot from different angles. And it's so important that as people in power in the media, that we're able to show perspectives and tell perspectives and tell these stories from different lenses and angles. And so mm -hmm. we got some Howard University students here, and I'm glad to see you guys because a lot of you are in the School of Communications. You're going to go into television, film, radio, and your job is going to be to share someone's story. To be a, you're going to be in a position where you can let someone else speak you're going to be in a position where you can help someone tell their story and bring it to light. And so I'm so proud of the ARC-12 project. Uh, I'm so proud to, to bring this on to WHUT's platforms. Um, we take mental health very seriously, and it's about how do we get these messages out? How do we share these perspectives? And, um, you know, I want to bring up Keisha Nelson quickly. Um, she is our director of education and outreach. And so it's not just what you see on television or what you see, come on, Keisha, what you see on YouTube and all that. It's also how do we actually directly affect the community. So we want to speak to some of our other programs that we have with PBS um, for mental health and also um, how we use our op these opportunities to reach the community. I also want to shout out the School of Social Work who is here today as well. We appreciate you all for being here and supporting this effort. Thank you so much, Angie. And thank you guys for being so transparent open and honest about your experiences because um, as we know like change occurs in these rooms spaces like these um, and the conversations are sparked by things that we see on TV um, my role as the education outreach manager is to take what we see on TV and bring it into intimate spaces like these um, take what we see on TV and really start to think about ways where we can enact change where we can follow up because we got to be responsible right and we think that that's very important here at WHUT especially when it comes to mental health because I don't know about y'all but the pandemic did not help my mental health <laughs> it did not. Um, and so it's a topic that we take seriously, particularly amongst young people. Um, and so we have programming that you can access through the PBS app right now. If you are um, locked into WHUT, we have a special called Hiding in Plain Sight. And that follows the journey of 20 students who are between the ages of 11 and 27. And they recount their experiences with mental health. But even further more than that, we've partnered up with um, a local housing community, Highland Dwellings um, in Southeast, to enrich and encourage their young people there in that community. And also, um, we have some things that are coming in the works with the Boys and Girls Club because we believe this work is very, very important. And so again, you know, I really applaud you all. Thank you for being so transparent. It's, it is very, very heavy and emotional, but this is also your real life. And so, you know, we take that seriously and uh, we stand with y'all. And um, as we seek to get healing from our own, you know, our own trauma too. Um, so thank you for this space today. Thank you all for coming and for allowing us to sort of um, hold space for this very, very important topic. Thank you, Keish. I appreciate it, Keisha Nelson. Um, and we're going to keep this program going. And I want to say this. What was awesome about the, if when you see it in its entirety, is that it's not all low. You don't feel, it, it's, it's hard to watch. But I was also inspired at the end of it. I was so inspired by you guys. I was so energized by you all um, at the end of the conversation. And it made me look, it, you, here's what's interesting. I, I shared this with our our. Um, head of production, right? We both were saying, wow, these are some really handsome guys, right? Like, if I'm walking by or I'm in the same facility as that, I would never think that that this was their backstory. And it just goes to show that you never know what people are going through. And we got we to gotta be a little kinder to each other. Um, and that's a reminder even for myself. Because sometimes we're so worried about ourselves and what we got going on 
that we forget that the people that we're projecting our pain or our anger, our frustrations out on, they, they got their stuff going on too. And that could cause uh, just a whole lot of unnecessary things, right? So without further ado, we're going to keep it going. We're going to have an extended conversation because the other aspect of the ARC-12 project is how do we keep this conversation going um, and how do we continue to share with each other? So I'd like to uh, bring up our the stars of the show. We're going to have them come up and then I'd like to introduce um, our host of this panel. Come on up, fellas. And I want to introduce... Uh, a man who who is a very huge inspiration to me. I was sharing with him how he inspired me and came and spoke to, right here at Howard University when I was a student. Um, he goes by the name of Frank Ski, and he's been doing the Frank Ski Show since 1985. Okay, <laughs> these students, y'all thought I was I was older. No, uh, no, but Frank Ski says 1985, man. He's done the Frank Ski show from Baltimore to Atlanta to the DMV, nationally syndicated. This brother right here is such an inspiration. He always does this vitamin of the day. And I, I tune in on uh, 96.3 WHUR to hear that vitamin of the day and the song he plays after. Um, and he's such a powerful example of just a, a powerful black man supporting other uh, black men up here. And so, ladies and gentlemen, Frank Ski can we show him some love. You hear him in the afternoons on 96.3 here in the DMV and across the country. Thank you. All right. I guess we need one more mic for our guest. If we got one in here. Yeah, I think they have the love. Oh, they have the love. Oh, perfect. Oh, there you go. And I got one too. Don't worry. So I, I don't actually need mine, do I? Oh, look at that. I forgot where I was at. There it is. Um, first, let me just say this. Um, thank you for your bravery. I mean, you know, um, the hardest part is for people to admit something is wrong, but to be able to do it the way you all did it so eloquently, I just want to say thank you. And just to, just to share with everybody, as a father, I have a son that's like your age where I went through that. And interesting enough, as I was watching your stories, you know what it showed me? Mm -hmm. All the mistakes I've made as a parent. Everything I thought that was right, that I was doing that was right to help, I realized at the end that I was actually making a mistake. When you talked about being in the back of the police car, I, I've had that happen to my son. And when you said that, it really hurt me because I felt like, you know, I failed him. But I think what you guys are doing by presenting this in the way you did is actually opening up, not only for people that are suffering through it, but for people and families to better understand how they can help. Because at the end of the day, I think people want to be able to help. Um, and it's very difficult to do that. To be vulnerable, to talk about losing a family member is, is tough. You know, I, I can only imagine. Um, to be vulnerable, to say that, you know, you almost lost your life is tough. And I, I just wanted to say thank you for that. Um, I guess... My first question would be for most people that are listening, um, and it goes in line to what you were saying about calling the hotline, trying to get help, and somebody telling you it's going to be a month. Yeah. You know, I mean, that, that's got to be the hardest thing in the world, to, to, right? You're calling out for help, and then somebody says to you, oh, well, we can see you next month. I mean, that's, that's like painful, even even for me to even realize that. So I think your story helps to bring about change. Um, but what was the hardest part about getting to the point, and anybody can answer this, getting to the point of asking for help? What was the hardest part? Because I'm sure you, you alluded to it in the beginning, Noah, that, mm -hmm. that you had the thoughts before you went for help. Mm -hmm. But what was the hardest part to go from the thoughts to asking for help? Because I think what what I report on the radio and what people see is a lot of times when people are gone, their friends say, oh my God, I didn't know. Mm -hmm. What was the hardest part? I think the hardest part honestly was just really like that getting like the terms with like, okay, if I don't do something now, I'm gonna do something harmful to myself in the future. So it's probably best if I go ask for help now, cause you know, if, if I don't, you know, I could not be here tomorrow. So it was just coming, it was just coming to grips with that idea of like, okay, I might actually do this in the future. That was the hardest part. Uh, the hardest part with asking for help? Yeah. 
I would say the hardest part with asking for help is that nobody really typically understood what I was going through. You know, everybody has their own mental battles in their head that not really many people can relate to. So you try to talk about your problems to a friend or to a buddy, and you know, they're going through their own problems. Everybody's problems is different. So your problems and their problems might not match up. So basically that's the hardest part when you're asking for help is trying to find someone who actually understands. You need somebody that understands, mm -hmm. basically. Yes, yeah. I feel like my situation was a little bit different because I was already on social media and I was already sharing my story. So like as I was growing up, I was always um, posting what I was going through, things that I'm going through, um, situations that I'm in at the moment. So it was a bit different for me because I posted my brother passing away. I posted myself crying. I posted my, my story. I posted, hey, guys, reach out for help. Hey, guys, this is what's going on. I, want, I don't want anybody else to go through this. So people already knew that I needed the help. It wasn't me more so like, I need help. People already came to me, they gave me advice, you know. But the help that I, the thing that helped me the most was me helping other people, was me sharing my story. Because then I see what people are going through and they're giving me advice and we're both learning from each other at the same time. One of the things that I saw while watching this um, was the fact that people look at you, and An Angie Ann said it best. I mean, if I was walking through the campus, I'd look at you all and say, man, they got it together. <laughs> like, bro, I'd walk up and say, man, they got it together. You guys are all good looking, fly, dress cool. I mean, I don't, I don't see no issues. You know what I'm saying? How hard is that to have that, have that front like everything is right, but then inside everything mm -hmm. is not right? My friends will tell you, like, one thing I do a lot is I'm always scared that, like, I'm coming off as, like, too much or annoying. So, like, I will, like, keep it inside, like, how, like, I'm feeling about that day because I don't want to, like, annoy anybody. And ha the front is hard. Like, like you see, like, right now, like, I smile a lot. And that's kind of, like, how, like, I, like, make people, like, know, like, oh, no, I'm good. You know, like, I'm doing my Noah smile. It is what it is. I'm cool. But, you know, some, like, sometimes, you know, it's, like, it's just a way for me, like, to hide how, like, I'm truly feeling. And it gets it gets hard after a while. But... That, but, you know, the older I get, the older, like, I realize, no, my friends do care and I can, you know, really be like, hey, I'm not feeling so good today. I'm not going to come out. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm all right. You know, you don't got to worry about me, but I'm going to stay in tonight. OK. And what about this? What answer this question, each of you, if there was one thing that somebody could have done, what would it have been? Mm. What do you mean? If there's one thing that. Something could, I mean, we're, we're trying to figure this out as a whole, as a community, as a country. We're trying to figure the best way to handle this. What would be one improvement, either um, outside of your home or inside of your home, that could have made this better? Like, you know, if, if I was talking to my son, would he have said, you know, I, I really needed you to understand more. I really, I really needed you to, to listen more. You know, I need you to have more empathy. What, what would it be inside the home or even outside of the home that you would say could help? I would say never assume and just to always be gentle. Never assume what people are going through. Never assume, like you say, just because somebody's handsome does not mean they have it all together. Just because somebody um, looks good does not mean that they're this type of person that you think they are. You have to be gentle with, with everybody because a situation that could have happened to me could have broke anybody else. A situation that I'm going through just because I made it through and I'm able to speak to other people about it does not mean that anybody else can come to you and speak about it and you know have the same outcome it, you have to be gentle with everybody and just learn people and learn yourself as well uh, I would definitely have to say self-love um, if you have no self-love within yourself you can't really understand what other people are saying to you um, the biggest thing that could have helped prevent me from committing suicide is self-love. If you don't love yourself enough, you're going to lose yourself in this matrix, you know? This life is literally a curse and a blessing, you know? You get to wake up every day and see how life is so beautiful, but also you got to go to work, you got to make sure the bills are paid, and you, nobody has time to make sure you're okay all the time. So you need to make sure yourself is okay. Okay and to learn self-love big factor for me for me i would ask someone if like you're okay like twice you know be like just someone ask, hey you okay and they say no nah, yeah i'm good be like are you sure i would say just like ask someone twice and i feel like that could help a lot 
So I, I had a, I had a, um, uh, a friend recently, <clears throat> very close. He, he was he was the socialite of the city. He just like he was at every event, knew everybody important, was always supportive, was always the guy. And he was really going through some tough times and we'd have lunch and I just looked at him as being so strong in everything that he did. And then one day my phone rings and he took his life and everybody was just shocked because nobody saw it. And I think leading to what you said, asking twice, mm -hmm. maybe three times is probably the best thing. And you know, we, we feel guilty afterwards that we, we did not do that enough to say that. Um, in, and we're gonna open it up to the floor in just a second. Um, in all of that, let me ask this. As a father, when I grew up, when I was your age, it was tough. I mean, I didn't have to walk to school barefoot like mm -hmm. my grandparents <laughs> did, but you know, it was tough. You know, it's tough it up, tough it up. Like you, you complaining. Mm -hmm. Y'all got it best. Y'all got it good. What y'all complaining about? <laughs> you got iPhones and go online. We ain't had none of that. You know what I'm saying? So when I would hear my kids, you know, complaining all the time, be like, man, please, y'all got it easy. Is, is, is it really that different in these times than it was back then? Yes, because like I said, the situation that you've been through, that you've been through, you, just because you were raised like that and you made it and you became this person out of that situation, that could have broke anybody else. Okay. Some people are growing up differently, some people think differently, and some people are just more sensitive than others. So I feel like when I was growing up also, like, I had to walk to school. I was probably like 10 or 11 walking to school and it was like, oh, it was like a good 20 minute walk. And I'm telling my dad like, hey, it's cold. Like, can you give me a ride? The days he, sometimes he would, you know, if I asked him and stuff. But sometimes he's like, no, when I was younger, you know how, how long I had to walk to school? I'm like, yeah, but that's not, you know, this is a different situation. That was what, the 60s, 80s, mm -hmm. 70s? And he was like, but my point is to say, <laughs> is to say that it's different. We think different and you have to get to know people. Don't expect that because you are strong enough to get out of a situation, somebody else is going to have the same heart and the same strength and the same will power to make it. Any situation. Right. Uh, so you're saying how different it is? Yeah. I mean, for me, because sometimes I would look at like, man, y'all just complaining. It ain't that bad. Well, I would also say social media plays a huge factor in this now because back then you guys didn't really have social no. media. So social media is a huge platform used by billions. Um, that's how a lot of rich folks and a lot of people show off what they have. And you know, a lot of females typically show their bodies. And a lot of people use that, stig that, that stigma um, to try to be like them. Everybody wants to be different and not really want to be in their own lives. So that's called the metaverse. That's what we're moving into now is the metaverse. So with that being said, when somebody sees a nice car, they're like, why don't I have that nice car? Right. Someone sees a chain, why don't I have that chain? Why don't I got them shoes? Why do we need them shoes? You know, why do you need what that other person has? And that makes someone else feel less important because they don't have that. Yeah. I live in a blessed life, but when I hop on social media, I'm like, oh, I need them pair of Gucci shoes. I need, you know what I mean? Yeah. Because I make myself seem less important than they are, even though I'm more important than they are. Got it. You know what I'm saying? No. I feel like it's, um, you got to tune your parenting style to like the way things are like nowadays. Um, I don't think hard love, like the way like it was like back in like the 60s and 70s works anymore. I, you can still be like tough on your kids when they mess up, but you can't be, but it's not the same like how it was back then. You know, like you can't like just hard punish like, like that anymore. So I think you just gotta like really just attune your parenting style to how, like how the way it is now. It, it's, it's crazy. I, I, I was having this conversation with my co-host. We had a real argument. She's, she, Nina is very nurturing and, and whatever, whatever, right? And I'm like, Nina, man, your kid's gonna live at home till they 30. <laughs> my kid's out at 18. She's like, no, you hard, you hard. I said, well, when I came home at 18, my dad read the letter and the next week I was gone. She was like, no, nah, it's not like that no more, bro. You can't do that. And when we take calls, we see how things have changed. It's not like that anymore. We have to be more humbling and say, you know what, maybe we need to give them more time and more help and more understanding because it is harder than it was before. And I truly understand that. So thank you guys. I want to open it up. And if anybody's got any questions, there's a mic right here in the middle. Just come on up to the middle mic and 
you can definitely ask, ask your question of this panel, but do me a favor, please give them a round of applause. <laughs> right here, my man. How you doing? My name is uh, Aaron Lord. So my question is, um, so I kind of grew up in like a, re a results, like my dad always taught me it's a results driven world. Um, people don't really care what you have going on. They care about what the results are afterwards. So I always kind of grew up thinking you tough it out, you know, tough times don't last, tough people do things like that. And I will say that that helped me a lot in life. But my question is, when do you think that that is too much? Like, how do you know, okay, like, you know, it's been, you know, when, do, when is it too, when do you know when it gets too much is my question. Anybody? Um, I would say it gets too much and like you're like prioritizing like getting like an A on like, a, on like an exam or like getting like the next, like, like making sure he gets promotion at your job and like the, as quick as you can and like instead of like your own health. So instead of like using like the money you get from like your check to like, you know, get you some food, use that money you get from your check to like put you like in a program that like gets you like further ahead in life which that does help in like the long run but like you got to eat every single day so i feel like it gets too much when you just like prioritize like everything else besides like your own like Im like immediate needs like food and like mental health Go ahead. i guess too much when at the end of the day life is a journey like it's a process you have to live every day you're not, I feel like it's, if I was to think like that not, that, not that there's anything wrong to think like that, but if I was to think like that, I, f I wouldn't feel accomplished if this whole time I'm going to do something and I'm trying to get this result and I don't get it. So the whole three years that I wasted to get this result and I didn't get, I've spent it and I was very unhappy. So I feel like it gets too much when you're prioritizing this result rather than actually living every day and trying to enjoy your life and just actually paying attention to the small things, the things that matter like family, like um, love, like having out, going out with your friends, like things like that, rather than being so hard on trying to accomplish something when at the end of the day, it's life. You never know if you're gonna get it. So it's like, just make sure you live in the moment. That's when it gets too much, when it intervenes with you living in the moment and being happy. All right, anybody else, question? <clears throat> Hello, so I got a little emotional on the part where you were, when you were um, overdosing in the bed. This year I have, seen two overdoses so far and they both i've seen how like the narcan pen have helped but my question to you is you're still in college right now so like how have you dealt with drugs and alcohol because you know like we're in a college where people are openly still like using drugs and alcohol so like what have you done to like help your experience with that i would have to say um i never really been into hard drugs and uh, alcohol. Um, so with that being said, if a student is overcoming them battles, I would have to say, mm. Ooh, that's a hard subject. Um, I, I, would, I would say you have to find yourself. I mean, if a student is, all right, let's say, for instance, after I woke up out of my coma, the first thing that I didn't do was backstep. I didn't backstep, I forward step. I, I Michael Jordan jumped and dumped that, you know what I'm saying? So I feel like if someone is going through something, drugs and alcohol is not the way to go because when you wake up tomorrow after you having your drug injected or smoked, you're gonna feel the exact same the next day. So with drugs and alcohol, put it down, put it aside, find yourself out, find who you truly are and not let the drugs upside uh, from that distraction, from finding out who you really are. That's the most important part. Sorry. Good point. Do you, think, do you think some of that has to do with the environment? Is it, is it a circle of friends? Is it, do you find that you gotta find your right circle to keep you in the right place? Yes. I personally feel like because when I, when I turned 18, I was living in New York City, but I um, applied to school in London, in Europe. And I left to London and I was by myself over there. I didn't have, I've never visited London. I've, I didn't even know where, what it looked like, where I was gonna stay. I was literally just, you know how 18 year olds are. They're like, yo, I can't wait to get out of my house. I can't wait to leave this house. But I left, I left, I left the continent. Like I was really out. Um, and I was over there, but I was by myself. And I, the people that I became friends with were people who did hard drugs, who were doing these things. And I found myself in a loop. 
um, up until like my brother passed away where, you know, I had to come back home and then I got out of, out of that situation of that environment. And I was like, wow, maybe it wasn't just me this whole time. And I was and I kept blaming myself and I felt guilty. And although I was still in college and I graduated college and I did all I had to do, it was that the environment had a lot to do with it. Because yeah. once I surrounded myself with people who are a little, you know, um, more sane, have healthier habits and do stuff that actually make your soul feel alive rather than your body, your soul needs to be lit. Drugs, they make your, your body feel good. But soul, it's, it's deteriorating it. It's not making you feel good. Like he said, tomorrow you're going to wake up and you're going to feel the same way. Your soul is going to feel even probably more dead. No? I'm going to combine with like what both of them said. I think like moderation is very important. You have to like, also, like I don't think like you drinking like one, like, like one bottle of beer is going to like ruin your life. But I also do think like you got to know like who you're with because like, you know, you might only want to have one, but you might like, because depending on who you with, you might have seven. But I do think the most important thing is moderation because you, cause like, I don't think you doing like a drug or like or sipping like some alcohol is gonna make you like the worst version of yourself. But moderation is very important because you can slip and like slide and doing way too much. But I think like one or like one or two, like every, you know, every time, you know, every now and then is okay. So very much like look into moderation. Okay. Awesome. Any other questions? I would like to go ahead answer on that question as yeah. well. I, I definitely say it's the environment because when I was a kid, the way I grew up was with my father. He was very abusive. Um, I'm not going to say I grew up abusive, but I learned from it. And it triggered me to have anger issues from learning from that environment. Um, money, my mom loves to spend money, but I sit there and watch her. I watch her do it. And then I picked up from that environment. Your subconscious mind picks up everything that you're doing, even though you're not paying attention to what you're watching. Mm -hmm. See, your subconscious mind is super powerful. So if you got a group of friends and you may not be smoking or you may not be drinking, but you're watching, you're sitting there watching them do it every time. Your subconscious mind is learning that it's okay. Mm. It's okay to feel like that. It's mm. okay to go take a drug one time. And that one time might take your life, you know? Mm. Listen, oh. <laughs> I'm just in fact. Hi, how y'all doing? Um, my name is Edward and um, for, oh. Closer. Okay. What's up? My name is Edward. And um, first, I thank you all uh, for your transparency because transparency brings forth more transparency. So I have also sat in y'all's shoes. I had a time in my life where I tried to take my life. So I completely understand. Um, but my question is, so after my incident, um, my family came forth and started being transparent about you know, their thoughts and the things that they did that we had never talked about as a family because as we know, people keep family secrets. So my question is after you all each went through or you know, your feelings and your things, did anyone in your family come out and admit like, I went through this too? Cause you know, that brings forth healing also. I'm very thankful to have like a open like communication with like my parents and like the rest of my family members. So after I like went through like my incidents, they did come out and said, I was feeling the same exact thing. like you were feeling, I just didn't know like when to really tell you because it's like, that's a hard conversation. But I do think like, uh, it's like, you gotta get like, it's, all families aren't open with each other like that. But if you are, I do like highly encourage, like do you just like straight up, just like tell your family, like how you're feeling at that moment. Yeah. Mm. Anybody else? Uh, I would have to say my parents are not very as open as that, so I would say my mom, I brought her outside the box when I committed suicide. Let's just say that my mom's very uptight, strict, always, you know, you know that kind of mom. So when I woke up out of my coma and I went to the psych unit because I had to stay there for a week, um, she came in there and she bawled out her eyes to me. She started crying and telling me how she apologizes that she wasn't there, you know, that she could have done better, um, that she was sorry. So I feel like just because they're not as open as their, their feelings, their emotions, um, because not everyone is the same as us. Not everyone is vulnerable enough to come up here in front of people and to speak about their emotions. And my mom, and this might be like other people's parents, my mom don't like to talk about her feelings. My mom was stabbed 35 times uh, eight years ago by a man, Robin Chester. Uh, so after when that happened, she turned into a very strong, very powerful, independent woman. So yeah, with parents, they might come up to you in a different matter of perspective of how they feel about your situation. All right, anyone else? Yes. Yeah, 
guys, let me adjust this. <laughs> Hello everyone, my name is Sasha Turtzag. I'm a junior computer information systems major from Bloomfield Hills, Michigan. And first, I just wanted to say thank you for having this. This was super That's amazing. Right. Mm -hmm. But also just share my appreciation with the outreach and action items that you guys are doing within the community, specifically with the Boys and Girls Club. I went there all the time as a child, so just knowing you guys are working with communities, it's amazing. But my question is, at what age do you think these conversations need to be started and sparked within youth because I know I work with like a lot of underserved youth and I'm like their mentor and I'm like you know should we start having these conversations a little bit earlier and just wanting to know your experience as well want to start sure I think it's never too early it just depends the the way you're having the conversations like I'm not going to talk to an eight-year-old about suicide or about killing themselves but I'm going to ask them about their emotions I'm going to ask them how was your day and you take notes from that you know use the, the type of words that they use addiction how they feeling that some days they might say I'm feeling bad some days they might say I feel horrible so what is the difference between these two feelings what made you feel like this um, so just get a be aware of how they're feeling so let's just open up and just make sure that they know that it's okay to not be okay it's okay for them to say they, they had a bad day. It's okay for them to open up and be completely honest. So as long as, as, long as they make sure that they're, they're, it's safe to be honest, it's safe to speak your emotions, and it's safe to say how you feel, I feel like it will be uh, way smoother growing up and being able to acknowledge your own emotions and other people's emotions too. Pick up on your question. I would say age 16. I would say when you start to go to high school. I feel like when you go to high school, you start off in that freshman building, you're getting a whole experience of, a lot new people, you can experience from older people, you can experience to girlfriends, you can experience to drugs, you can experience to all of that. So I would say as soon as you hit that freshman year, I feel as that's when you should start attacking the hardest because that's when they're more eye-opening to everything. It's a new environment when you reach that high school building. And um, that's when grades start to become more important because people are stressed about college, people are stressed about where, where they want to go in life. So high school, that's the most important, I feel as if, because that's when somebody really needs somebody the most. I've seen people cry, I've seen people fight, I've seen people die. So pay attention to that time and experience. Yeah, I agree with both of them. <laughs> there you go. All right, so that's gonna wrap it. Again, a round of applause. Thank you very much. All right, Angie, wanna come up and close us out? Sean? All right, y'all, let's give it up again for Frank and uh, for our panel. Uh, outstanding job. And uh, again, we just want to thank you all for coming. You guys asked some incredible questions. I want to thank you for that because a lot of times uh, people are, I need to step back. Okay, boom. All right. Um, am I right in front of y'all? It's television, man. It's a crazy thing. But um, no, for, for real, you know, a lot of times we, we have screenings and sessions and people don't ask questions. And so I really want to applaud you guys. It seems like a simple thing, but you don't know how the question that you ask can really make a difference. And it may be something that somebody else may want to know, but just didn't have the courage to stand up and ask as well. So again, thank you for doing that. And for you guys, again, thank you for sharing your stories. And um, I know we have a, another piece that we want to bring up. Mark has a, a presentation that he wants to do, so we'll do that at this time. Not only are we grateful, the ARC-12 family, Noah, Christian, and Austin, Gary and I, uh, for what these young men are doing and saying and, and been through, uh, the United States Congress is also as happy with WHU-TV and Howard University and what you're doing. And um, they sent some gifts. The state of Texas, which is where we're from, they're very pleased and happy. Ooh, go ahead. On what, on, what, on, on, what we're, on what these guys are doing and what you're doing and grateful. So. The very first one is a amazing proclamation um, that I'm going to get my partner, um, 
Gary Bernstein to read. Uh, yeah, I think he reads a little better than me without my eyeglasses. But it is amazing. Let me show it to you. It is, it is thanking WHU-TV and what you're doing on, on the campus of Howard University. Uh, and I'll let Gary read it, and then I'm going to present one more, one more thing. It, it's so important. So thank everybody for coming. This was an amazing event, and uh, WHUT-TV, you know, a pillar of the community. We really appreciate it. And kids, you guys, and Frank Ski, amazing discussion. Thank yes. you very much. The proclamation says, WHUT-TV, Howard University Television, the secondary public broadcasting service licensed member television station on the occasion of the screening of the ARC-12 project Open Lines, whereas on October 13th, 2022, WHUT-TV Howard University Television will hold an exclusive screening of the ARC-12 Project Open Lines, a unique and unabashed film at the WHUT-TV Howard University Television Studio. And whereas WHUT-TV Howard University Television was founded in 1980 in Washington, D.C. as WHMM, at its inception, the station became the first and only public station in the United States to be licensed to and operated by historically black college and university, HBCU, Howard University, and whereas WHUT-TV broadcasts reach over 2.5 million households. The station strives to underscore Howard University's overall mission and its commitment to excellence, leadership, and public service. For nearly 40 years on air, WHUT has become a leader in broadcast communications by providing quality programming that is relevant and informative while offering exceptional professional training in television, production, engineering, and management. And whereas WHUT TV's mission is to deliver educational, entertaining, and intellectually stimulating multicultural and intergenerational programming to the public in the Metro DC region and. Whereas, WHUT-TV Howard University Television produces thought-provoking programs and has helped raise awareness for the nationwide suicide crisis in the African American community. WHUT-TV is committed to offering support and guidance for students experiencing mental health challenges. The station supports organizations like the ARC-12 Project, founded by Howard University student Noah Theory, who is committed to actively addressing and continuing the conversation around mental health on HBCU campuses across America. Now, therefore, be it resolved that on behalf of the constituents of the 18th Congressional District of Texas, I take great pride in recognizing WHUT-TV Howard University Television on the occasion of the screening of the ARC-12 Project Open Lines. Your station is deserving of our utmost esteem for your commitment to raising awareness for the nationwide suicide crisis in the African American community. It is indeed worthy of the respect, admiration, and commendation of the United States Congress. Signed, Sheila Jackson Lee, Member of Congress today, October 13th, 2022. On top of that, hold this for me real quick. On top of that, this, this is the United States flag presented to you, Sean. That has flown over the United States Capitol. It's been folded and it's presented to you with gratitude. Thank you for all you do. And one more, we're not going to read this one because it's from the great state of Texas and it's even longer because <laughs> of Texas. Um, this one is, is from my uh, state representative, Sean Theory, who is Noah's aunt. She actually attended Howard. She graduated from journalism. She's an attorney in Houston and a state rep. And same thing, uh, acknowledging uh, what, what we've done today and what we're going to do in the future. So that's that one. And thank you, thank you, thank you. And um, appreciate you. I, I, I have to contain my emotions because when, when, when one of you guys asked about parenting, I'll just take 30 seconds to say this. The hardest part is on the parent. When Noah came and told us he was considering harming himself, I just said, stop. The whole world has just stopped. 
right now. I even said to him, hey, man, to keep you alive, you and I can just head to the Saskatchewan. We'll just get out of here. I don't even care about anything if I'm going to lose you. So I think in the new world order, which I, I know you do, Frank, too, with your son, is we're right. We, we had to come into 2022 and say, it's a whole new day. They're dealing with a whole new thing. Austin said something so important. I had to get off social media because I kept saying, why am I not in Dubai? The whole world is in Dubai. You know, why am I not with a private jet? Everybody got a private jet. They're all in Dubai. They're all vacation. Why am I working? What did I do wrong? And I thought I had kind of done all right. You know, and so that was depressing for me. I had to get off. And then when I found these young men and, and Christian, and call out your little brother's name. Hmm? Your little brother's name. His name is Bragney Diaz. Bradley? Bragney. Bragney. When he told me about Bragney, I said, man, just imagine living with that. So I'm so proud of you. You know, to still be strong after losing somebody you love. You know, so an awesome story, you know, my God, being on life support. I don't even like to get a COVID shot. <laughs> you know, so so anyway, this has been an amazing deal. And for you guys and Angie, my God, you didn't have to do this. I mean, at the again, HBCU of the HBCUs, we could have been across the street, you know, doing this, and now we're actually on the campus of Howard University. So that's my conclusion. Thank you for everyone for coming out. Uh we saved some lives. We don't know it yet, but we saved some lives. And um, thank you, thank you, thank you. And thank Gary, because Gary's my partner. He's amazing. Um, this is the start of it all. This is not a one-stop. We're going to be coming up with solution-based activations across all the HBCU campuses. And this is not going to be the first time we're going to be here at Howard University. I mean, this discussion, this discussion is stage one. You know, and we really appreciate the cooperation with everybody. And any ideas anybody has, what else we can do, we're wide open. Yeah. But again, I'm just amazed at the courage of everybody here. And obviously the website is ARC-12 Project. You know, that's important to connect with the ARC-12 Project website because there's a lot of information on there that could be very valuable. Obviously we're live streaming this and we're gonna be continually updating the website with things that we're gonna be doing in the community. So I'm gonna say one more thing. I'm gonna put another one of my new sons on the spot. Um, this talented young man actually last night went to the studio and wrote and recorded a song for the R12 project. I blew my mind. So you want to say the lyrics or do anything like that? I want to give you the moment. Oh, sure. Is there a way I can play it? You want to just go acapella? Acapella? Oh, I'll, I'll, really I'll, I'll play it in the background. Yeah. Okay. Put it up here. Hey. Don't give up on your life. I swear it's not worth it. Nobody in this life is nowhere near perfect. Gotta gain self love. You just gotta learn it. Throw them demons in the bag. And then you burn it. I'm glad God saved me, even though I ain't deserve it. I finally found my purpose. Now I think I'm at my greatness. Took a lot of patience. Yeah, it took a lot of pain. Took a lot of ups and downs. But I finally feel I made it. Although you got the money and your perfect occupations. If you're not awoken, you would stay stuck in the matrix. This is your life if you manifest it. The universe will make it. I know there's hard times where it feels you can't take it. You give your trust to someone, somehow they always break it. I opened up my mind, I made a little money. Love is just distraction just to keep that shit on, honey, yeah. You can't give up on yourself. When it feels like you got nothing else, you gotta tell yourself it's okay. Even when you die inside, it's alright to not feel alright. That word, yo. <laughs> Final thing, uh, the Archer Project. We at our website, we hand make candles because Noah used to talk about how candles used to make him calm and so my wife believed in burning a lot of candles and now we make candles and we have gifts for our, of our team who help but the artrailproject.com it shows how you can support us and we turn around and use those funds to support others so this is a, our colors purple thank you
All right, again, thank you, everybody. We do have um, some resources that we want to make sure that we share. Uh, they're going to be um, flashing on the screen as far as resources, uh, especially Howard University students, our university counseling service. Um, they are awesome. They do answer the phone, the hotlines, um, and so those numbers will be available on the screen for you to see and uh, for you to use those. And, again, as you need it, they're 24-7, available on the weekends, overnight, whenever you need to talk to somebody, please make sure that you use those resources all right well thank you again everybody we do appreciate you coming out and we do have a reception that will follow out in the um, the hallway just outside of the studio thank you again and thank you to our WHUT staff oh, I'm wrong it's actually in the back of the room <laughs> so make sure you go to the back of the room and get your um, your, your snacks but again to our whole entire WHUT staff to uh, Angie Keisha Sharon I'm naming names Frenis I'm going to leave somebody out. Torrance, uh, Tree, Lou, I know anybody else? Eddie. Eddie, Shannon, everybody I can't see. But no, but thank you to you all. We really appreciate it. This is a team effort of making this happen. And Mark and Gary and Frank, again, a lot of support. And just want you all to know that you have the support of so many individuals across this campus. All right, thank you again. <laughs>